Thanks for coming. It's pretty wild, to be honest with you. Can you guys hear me? I'm a little short. You can ask my mom about that. She's sitting right there. So I figured I'd just read the prologue. Kind of get you in the mood, I suppose. So the prologue is called, This Is Me Now. Time was running out. Everything was falling apart. An army of slot machines dinged and whirled like a lazy, out of sync marching band. Corset clad waitresses, faces layered in makeup, waited at the bar to pick up a fresh round of drinks. Off in the distance, tourists hitched up their belts, tossed fistfuls of chips onto horseshoe shaped blackjack tables, and puffed on cheap brown cigars. I was almost jealous of them the thrill of the big bet the whiz and click of the roulette wheel, the f of the next card dealt. But I wasn't here to gamble. I slumped low in my chair, nearly defeated, stewing in the stale air of the casino bar, crumpled cigarette butts piled in the ashtray in front of me. Orphaned playing cards, aces and threes and jacks, hearts and clubs and diamonds, dropped and discarded after a long week, littered the carpet at my feet, taunting me. It was our last day in Las Vegas and my big reveal was crumbling. I needed to improvise to do something, anything, to pull off my scheme. I had been setting it up for weeks. I couldn't let myself fail. I was surrounded by magicians. They stood all around me, some of whom over the past year have become my best friends. There was Jeremy Griffith, the car junkie from Los Angeles, Xavier Spade, the no bullshit sleight of hand master from New York City, and Chris Ramsey, the bearded and tatted up YouTube pioneer, the guy who had gotten me into this mess in the first place. It had, been, it had been a year since I first fell into the underground world of magic and became friends with his key players. Everything had been building up to this moment. I couldn't let it all come tumbling down. It was now or never. We were in Las Vegas for Magic Live, the largest magic convention in the United States. Each August, thousands of professional and amateur magicians flocked to the Orleans, a depressing casino a mile south of the main strip and a few years past its prime. Bits and pieces of the theme decor, or at least the lifestyle associated with the slouchy wetness of New Orleans and the Gulf states, peppered its game room floor, and all the magicians invariably gathered at the Mardi Gras bar for drinks and talk. This little Bourbon Street themed lounge had more or less been our home since we showed up a few days earlier. I figured that I had plenty of time to pull off my plan. I thought I was all set. I had been keeping my secret for months and it was nearly killing me, but I had devised a scheme and I was determined to stick to it. Ramsey, I called out. He was chatting with Xavier. Come over here, I wanna show you something I've been working on. He walked over and I pulled a new deck of cards from my backpack. My heart raced and my hand shook as I fumbled with this box's cellophane wrapper, my fingers effectively turning to useless nubs. Ramsey chuckled sarcastically. Let me know when you get it that figured out, bud, he said, trying to walk away. Will you open it then, I said. He took the deck from me, tore off the wrapper, sliced through its adhesive heel with his middle finger the symbol for the four of spades tatted on its side near the deepest knuckle. He handed the deck back to me and I took the cards out of the box. Ramsey hiked up the sagging waist of his jeans, swiveled his baseball cap backwards, stroked his beard, and waited for me to begin. My heart lodged itself in my throat. I wasn't sure words could get past the dense pulse. Just point to a card, I said, stretching the cards out like a ribbon as I drew my hands apart. Ramsey pointed to one near the middle. That one, I asked. He nodded. Let's have a look. I squared up the stack and turned it over, revealing Ramsey's selection. The two of clubs, I said. Good choice. Now let's take your card. I pulled it from the deck, held it in my right hand, and placed the rest of the deck on the table next to us. And just... I ripped off the card's top right corner, a foot away from Ramsey's face. Watch, I said, slowly opening my right hand, which held the torn piece. I went from pinky to index, slowly lifting each finger one by one. But when my hand was completely open, there was nothing there. The piece had disappeared. Check your back pocket, I said after a pause. No, Ramsey shouted. He smiled, reached into his pocket, and pulled out the ripped corner. Aw, oh, man, he said, laughing. Check it, I told him. Make sure it fits. That's from the same card. He brought the two pieces together. The torn edges lined up perfectly. That was really good, man, he said. You got me. I'm impressed. But here's the thing, I said, holding out my hand. Let me see the piece. He placed it into my hand, face up the two in the club symbol, the card's index, visible to us. This is a special card, I said. I paused and looked up at him. His brow crinkled, unsure of what I was getting at. Because this is me now, I said. 
I'm the two of clubs. I'm in. Testing, testing. Yeah, how's this? Good. Good. Everyone can hear? Yeah. All right, cool. Great. Oh, wow. We're finally here, I tell you. It's been a it's been a long ride. And that kickoff, like that that little introduction is just so, so <laughs> it's it just drags you in hook line and sinker. Like I mean, yeah, such a pivotal moment, you know? And something I shared with you know with Chris as an intimate moment, you know? And that scene replays itself in the middle of the book as you end chapter one, or cha or part one rather. So Yeah. I feel like I've been watching you get into this world over a few years now and I was kind of heard a little bit about it at the beginning about this magic stuff uh didn't really know where it was going and by the end of it you went from like zero to a hundred like yeah. you were you were totally inside of it so where what was like the first inkling you had of this subject well you know I, I wasn't a kid who grew up you know with like a magic set or anything like that I really had no kind of precondition to magic other than they just like to watch it and I was, um, I was struggling pretty hard to get my footing as a writer in 2015. You know, I begin the book by saying I was basically homeless, where I was kind of crashing with a friend of mine in his office building in New Hampshire, which was an, an adventure in and of itself, but I was there to kind of get my career off the ground, you know? And I had seen a documentary about Ricky Jay, who recently passed away, so rest in peace, Ricky, who was a phenomenal magician. And I was thinking... I was so enamored by this guy's life behind the scenes and I thought well what's going on with magic now in the present day maybe with the younger generation and I was just kind of scrolling through Instagram and checking out hashtags and going on YouTube and um, I found that guy right there Chris <laughs> and I sent Chris like a, just a cold email like as a journalist hey I'm kind of curious about this like you're a magician like you don't look like a magician dude like what's the deal and he was kind of like, yeah, man, I mean, that's the whole point, right? That kind of sparked the friendship, and as you said, it went from zero to 100 pretty quick. So when, throughout the book, I really like these moments where you compare what you're seeing to the kind of old cliche of magic, which is like a guy in a top hat and a tux who's doing kind of goofy stuff on a stage. Like, what, what makes this new generation of magicians such a departure from that cliche? Like, and how do they, f how do you feel about like that? that image of a magician. Well, that was the first thing I noticed, you know, obviously looking at Chris, it didn't really embolden um, or embrace those stereotypes in any way. And I kind of wondered why that was, you know, I always, coming from just a traditional layperson, had always thought magicians would continue to embrace these sort of stereotypes, you know, because it's just what magicians do. But I think that with the current crop, they've understood that they have all these modern tools to their advantage. You know, magic used to kind of be set up like a monarchy, you know, it had these gatekeepers and these kings who would kind of like usher you through and they would make the rules and you'd follow them and then they would give you a seal of approval and you would kind of be, you know, ushered into this kind of upper echelon. But with the internet and social media, magicians had complete freedom to be who they ever, to be who they wanted to be in any capacity. And it became much more democratic in that regard. And I think that they understood that they could embody and reflect modern culture in a much more direct way because they weren't being told what to do. There, there was no hoops to jump through. So, you know, like people like Chris or Doug or Xavier or Daniel Madison or any of the other characters in the book, you know, they really took that to heart and were, were using these kind of modern technolo technological tools to build their own brand and put themselves out there in a way that, that they really wanted to. And that was kind of what initially sparked it, but then there's so much underneath that too that makes the modern, you know, re like resurgence of magic so special. Is, is this like a rebellion against the tradition? Like, are these guys kind of, guys and women, uh, coming together to kind of like form the new generation and put something new out there? Yeah, I think definitely. You know, I think if an art form has been kind of stuck in its old ways for so long, you're going to get people who are going to come by and kind of break the mold a little bit. I mean, you saw that with David Blaine in the late 90s, you know? David like threw everything out the window and started at its most basic form, you know, close up magic done for real people in real situations. And I think that his vision at that time was the was the strongest for where magic could go, you know, and he laid a new foundation for how people are approaching it now. 
but it's, you know, it's guys like, you know, Chris and Xavier and Doug and everyone else in the book who are kind of forming the, forming the new mold and saying, you know, yes, we can continue to progress. Yes, magicians can, can be like this. Yes, we can be tapped into culture and we can be inspirational figures online and, you know, we can cultivate personal fan bases and we don't need the TV deal to do it. We don't need these old systems. You know, so it was not only a rebellion against the kind of physical and visual representation of a magician, but you know, also the, the logistics behind it about how people get known and how they cultivate their influence and how the influence gets disseminated. Uh, there's, you address a lot in the book, like there's a lot of different strands, not just, oh, here's how I got introduced to this society of magicians. And one of, some of the funniest moments to me were when you go back through magic history and kind of cite these random people who invented a card device or invented a unique trick. Uh, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your process of like researching magic history and charting like magic history. It's not something we think of or that I thought of necessarily as having that much of a history, but there's literature, there's like creativity, there's all of this stuff behind it. Yeah, I mean, magic is like the world's old, like oldest art form if you think about it, you know? Magicians have been performing since ancient Egypt, and I didn't really know that, you know? Um, you know, you kind of heard stories about magicians, you know, performing during the Victorian era, and they, you know, they're the ones that started the whole top hat and, you know, white glove type thing. But when I started really digging into the history of magic, in terms of the nitty gritty, different individuals, like, like the many little narratives of how magic changed decade by decade, I saw some like incredible connections that I didn't know exist. For one, most sleight of hand, uh, at least some of the most used sleight of hand, doesn't really come from magicians, it comes from card cheats. So there's a book called The Expert at the Card Table, which is like the Bible for sleight of hand magicians where they don't go learn sleight of hand from another magician per se, they'll pick up this book which was written by this anonymous card cheat who may or may not have gotten murdered by cops when he was like on like running from the cops or like killing some other guy. So it's like you have all these little threads where you're like, wow, the history of magic is so rich and diverse. And in a strange way, it's not really promoted as that, you know, but you had all these interesting people who kind of spontaneously and, you know, perhaps without intent had influenced the craft in ways that they would never know until many years later. I mean, people still buy that book, you know, the, in my book, there are diagrams of hands that open every chapter and those are the diagrams you see in S.W. Erdnase's book, The Extra at the Card Table. They are modified, they have tattoos on them, but um, nonetheless, you know, you, you have to pay homage, you know, you have to pay respect where respect is due. So that type of stuff really interests me and I wanted to weave that in because I wanted to be like, oh, forget the past because you can't really do that. You have to recognize the past in order to create the future, right? So I've, I, I really wanted to give people a good primer on, you know, how magic has uh, evolved over the past couple hundred years. Like the the magicians that we're looking at today and we'll meet more later, they're they're looking at books that are centuries old. Like they're still using it today. And I think throughout the book you there are a few points at which you're like, it's hard to invent a totally new trick. Like there are only so many things you can do with your hands and a deck of cards. Right. Like So um you know, a lot of methods of magic are kind of built upon various different basic principles. You know, people don't understand this when they're just watching magic tricks because they're seeing a really great trick performed, right? But a lot of magic is coming from kind of tried and true ways to, you know, do things, you know? There's only so many things you can do with a deck of cards, and people have spent hundreds of years trying to figure all of that out. So it really is quite difficult to invent something completely new from scratch. Usually, you see a principle and then you build upon it, you know? You make it better, you refine it, you know? And that's really what a lot of magicians do because it, it makes those in, those in which they teach after that better at the craft as well. So magic is continually being refined and you know, once in a while someone will invent something completely new, completely groundbreaking that will send magic into a new direction. But everything's built upon the past, you know? It's just like really great kind of layered history where everyone's taking a little bit from those that came before them and you know, making it better or building something new. Yeah, I wanted to also get back to that link with card cheating. Like that I had no idea about really, that it was such a direct connection. Uh, and it also becomes clear as you meet all of the magicians in Ian's book that a lot of them come from that background as well. Like they started out messing around at poker tables and like sometimes got beaten up for it. And that's when they 
turn to magic for the first time, like as a, as a kind of safe way of practicing the, the same skills. Like, do you see that? It's yeah. not a redemption narrative, but like that transition from like illegal to legit magic kind of. Yeah. I mean, I think that's the thing, like magicians or people that want to become magicians are kind of drawn to that sort of mischievous, kind of immoral type of role. You know, I think it's a natural transition. And yeah, you know, Daniel Madison, you know, his backstory, the one he, you know, explained to me, the one he tells is that he, you know, was a card cheat when he was a late teenager and then he got caught in a game and, you know, he got beaten up, but he started using his kind of penchant for sleight of hand to start doing magic, you know? But, you know, even still, like across the spectrum, there's people who are still pulling inspiration from card cheats. There's a guy, you know, a friend of mine who made him, uh, I mentioned in the book, uh, Mark Calabrese, he actually went on one of Vice's uh, TV shows and he was demonstrating card cheating and he's a magician, you know, they made him wear a mask and shit and he was just like, you know, like oh, his voice was distorted as if he was a real card cheat, but he's just a magician who can do that stuff. So you, you can see like, like the line is drawn. But also on a personal level, I mean, I grew up playing poker, you know, like my mom is a poker player. She's right here. Mom. Um, <laughs> You know, and my, my mom makes a, you know, heavy appearances throughout the book. She's like a thread in the book as well, but, you know, just on a, on a technical level. I remember being like six years old, and she would teach me how to shuffle the deck of cards, and she showed me some, maybe some cheating moves, you know. Well, if you put an ace on the bottom and you shuffle like this, it's on top. You can deal it to yourself. <laughs> and I was like, you know, I would, you know that's, kind of, that's kind of like what the little bit of a connection I had, you know, because her and I played cards together. Throughout high school, we still go to the casino every year, normally for her birthday or, you know, Mother's Day, something like that. We, we take a trip together. So that sort of connection into my personal life was something I think that gave me a little bit of a leg up, you know, in the magic world because I kind of had that mindset too. Like, you know, I like to lie, you know, like, and, you know, cheating is kind of fun sometimes. So, I mean, I was kind of part, I was kind of part and parcel for getting it started. Yeah, you, you talk a little bit about how you're kind of used to having a deck of cards in your hands and, and oh, yeah. playing around with it. So many decks of cards, you know? That's what we grew up doing. You know, we go camping and it'd be like, all right, turn the lantern on. Like, we're going to, you know, play poker, you know, five card draw or hold them, you know, wh like what have you. You know, and that, you know, that definitely intensified over the years, you know? And uh, yeah, great memories. And we're still creating new ones. At the, at the card table. I, th I, think, I think we've been losing recently, but. <laughs> Ian's mom is really like a heart of the book, I think. Uh, and it's really fun to get to know her through it. So I'm, I'm excited for you all to have that experience also that I had already. Uh, and your, your family becomes involved in this in a, in a very deep way uh, that maybe is not so apparent from the outset. Like it's not apparent from you pulling that trick on Chris, like, you know, getting to be part of the society, but it's really important to the story, I think. So maybe you could talk about how that comes up and, and you know, your backgrounds in the book. Yeah. So um, my father passed away when I was 13. Uh, he had a stroke and he died very suddenly. And I think for any kid entering his teenage years, that's a pretty traumatic event. You know, your father kind of ushers you into your adulthood. He kind of cements your identity you know, and, and perhaps you carry a piece of him with you during this time. So I've always been kind of searching for that element of myself that I hadn't really been able to find yet. I was kind of waiting for this epiphany or some sort of journey to allow me to kind of find that. You know, and as I was living this book, you know, I lived it every day. And I got to know all these characters so intimately. I, I realized that we were all on a journey in a way to find the truest version of ourselves, you know? And a lot of people in the book, they have similar backstories, you know, where they come from somewhat of a rocky upbringing for whatever reason, and they use magic as a tool and a vessel to find themselves and to, and to become better people and to have a purpose and to make connections with others. And as I started to realize that, I kind of understood that this book was really about me and my life. And I remember, I, I didn't want to believe this at first. I was in complete denial about what I really had to write. And I submitted my first draft to Carrie. And she, uh, Carrie Thorne, my editor, who is beautiful and amazing. You should give her a round of applause, please. <laughs> so I submitted the story, and it was like all the really awesome, rad adventure stuff. And like super top level. And Carrie 
you know, and mom was in it a little bit, but not much, you know, it was more of like, yeah, and then he kind of, you know, she wasn't really there again. Carrie has me in her office a couple weeks after I gave her the draft, and I, you know, she looks at me, and I'm like, okay, just say it. She's like, there's not enough of you in this book, Ian. And I, and I knew it, you know, and it's just, it's hard for me to bring this stuff out, you know, but I understood that this, this story and this adventure, this thing that I've been living, that was what it was really about, to finally tell myself that I've become the man that my father would have been proud of and that it's okay and that I've made it. And everyone else who's been in my shoes too is here with me and they're sharing that sense of accomplishment and that sense of purpose now. So Carrie sent me out of the office, you know, but before I left, I told her, I said, you know, have about a quarter of a book already written about all this. It had been sitting in a vault on my computer for months, a long time. And I knew that one day I'd have to bring it out, you know? So I sent it to her, and um, she took out the uh, butcher knife and started cutting the book and putting stuff in, and, you know, I think, like, we did it in about six weeks, maybe less. And then you have this, this journey that flows, you know? The first couple chapters is the kind of start of the adventure, and then you dive into some family, and you're kind of like, I don't really know why. And you keep going, and then there's more of mom and more of dad, and all these things happen, and then at, at the end, you have the logistical conclusion and the emotional conclusion, and that's when you know what the book is really about. It's not really about magic tricks, you know? It's about identity. It's about coming of age. It's about being okay with yourself. And that's what I hope people get out of this book, because that's why I wrote it. And I think that really comes through. Uh, but another part that comes through is that all of the tricks are extremely cool. <laughs> yeah. It's like very fun to hear about. Yeah, they're uh, great. And something that I was curious about as a writer how how do you describe a magic trick? Like, how do you go about depicting something that it's is brutal. supposed to surprise you? It's brutal. <laughs> like, well, we can talk to Larry and Sasha, my agents back there, husband and wife duo, give them a round of applause. <laughs> I wrote a proposal, you know, and I attended to them, and we were working on it together to get it ready to bring to market, and that was one of the things where, like, how do we make a book about magic and magic tricks interesting if you don't get to see the trick performed, you know? And it, it, it required, you know, to use the metaphor, a little bit of sleight of hand on, on my part as a writer because I needed, to under, I needed to make sure that the tricks I was going to describe to the reader were interesting on paper. You could visualize them. They, they brought you in and you could follow them, you know, um, procedurally. You understood what was happening based on what I was telling you. And we had some tricks that we, I think we read about that just didn't. And they were like, okay, we have to figure out a new way to you know, write about this. And that was one of the most difficult parts because not only are you risking confusing the reader, but you're kind of playing with the art form. It's like if I don't translate this the right way and someone has to read it, I'm kind of like, it's kind of a small affront to magic. You know, I need to make sure that this seems real on the page and that you can follow it. So, I mean, that was probably some of the most difficult parts of the book because I really had to take my time and try to understand how this is going to come across to the reader because there's nothing there's nothing there, there's no bigger failure than having your reader be confused right <laughs> clear and complete the rules of journalism right clear and complete so that's like the whole time i was just re i was just kind of reiterating that to myself but i think i think some of the tricks came across quite well yeah i i totally agree i mean it's it's funny like as the writer you have to both explain you have to d show your reaction as the victim, basically, yeah. of the trick. Like, you have to show how you were surprised, and then you kind of go behind the scenes and talk about what happens in the trick and why it happens and, like, how the thought process, essentially. Uh, and that also really comes across as you're inventing your own trick uh, right. throughout kind of the second half of the book, I right. would say. Uh, and that was another huge kind of subplot and thread throughout the book and I found it totally fascinating. Uh, so maybe you could describe uh, the trick that you invented called Flipside, I right. think, uh, and what the challenge, what what the challenges you overcame were in doing it, like telling the story and setting it up. Well, basically as a kind of just primer, you know, a storytelling primer is that you have to have a climax to which you're kind of on your way to. You know, any great drama has an ending that you know is coming, but you're not sure how it's going to end type thing. And, you know, just that premise of storytelling was something that kind of 
push me to want to invent something because a, a benchmark for young magicians is to invent a magic trick and then contribute it to the art form, allow other people to perform it. You know, you can sell it online through these really big online uh, retail outlets. You know, I remember talking with, it, with Xavier about it when we went up to uh, Buffalo, New York for a convention. And we would, you know, speak about how important that was because that's what gave you credibility. And I think for me, someone with zero credibility, that would be something that I could do to kind of put myself up there. But I had no idea how to invent a magic trick. I mean, how do you invent a magic trick? I mean, there's no real, real right answer to that. And, and, but I, I also wanted to draw from parts of magic that I really enjoyed, you know? I love card effects, you know? I love, I love uh, card tricks or any trick that feels like a little bit of a story, you know? I love when you can grab information or have freely chosen information from a spectator put into a trick and that helps the trick kind of go. So I invented a card trick um, it's a transposition effect, really, where someone writes down their best friend's name on a card, I don't see it, um, and then they put that in their pocket, they pick a card, and then at the end, uh, the cards switch places, effectively, where they, the card that they choose, say it's the King of Hearts or King of Diamonds, goes back in the deck, they spell out the name of their best friend, and then the next card is their card, but then when I turn the card over, I'm holding the signed card and in their pocket is the king. So it's, it, you know, the premise is really quite simple, and that's what allowed me to do it, because I don't really have 10 years of experience doing this stuff. But I thought that the, the, the overall um, narrative of the effect was, was quite good. Can you still do it? Like, are you, have you practiced it lately? I, yeah, I practice it sometimes. What is, I, don't, I don't remember the last time I performed it, but. <laughs> maybe, maybe tonight. Maybe tonight. <laughs> maybe tonight at the after party when I'm not in front of 120 people. And I want to save the magic for these guys, because. I don't want to, you know, set a bad precedent. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, we can start with low expectations, and then... <laughs> oh, yeah, maybe. Uh, we'll see about that. <laughs> well, no, actually, the, throughout the book, Ian does do... He, like, learns magic and learns how to do magic tricks and practices. Uh, and one of the climactic moments is when he pulls a... Okay, so what is the correct vocabulary for, like, performing a magic trick? Like, to, That's basically it. To do a magic trick? Yeah. Perform an effect or a trick. <laughs> so he he does a magic trick with or on Anthony Bourdain. Right. Uh, so it's funny because I so Doug McKenzie's kind of a man about town, right? Doug's always like taking us to places and we're doing crazy stuff and we always experience really amazing things. And one night we're hanging out at, at my place. It was Xavier, Doug, and I. And Doug's like, "Well, let's just go to Ludlow House. It's like a members-only club in downtown Manhattan." And Doug, uh, you know, we get in Doug's car and we go. And the place is packed, packed, packed. We can't find a seat. And then we see these two women, and they're like in their 50s, and they're really well-dressed and like very Madison Avenue. And they're taking up this kind of sofa with these two tables. And, you know, Doug convinces them to let us sit down. And we sit down, and we, you know, we take out our decks of cards, and we're playing around or whatever. And then, you know, they had said to us, well, our friends are coming, so we have to make room. And we're like, yeah, whatever. Like, we're sitting here. We don't care. And then these two, th th these two dudes rolled up, and we look up, and it's Eric Repair, who owns Le Bernardine, which is one of the best restaurants in the world, and then Anthony Bourdain, and we're like, those are your friends, oh my god. <laughs> but then these guys, you know, they start smirking a little bit, right? Because they know shit's about to go down, right? <laughs> so we keep playing with the cards, and the women are like, are you guys playing a game? And, you know, I think Doug had said, no, we're just magicians, and they're like, oh my god, magic, I love magic. <laughs> So then Doug and Chris just go in on these two women, and they were so nice, and they loved it. And they start, like, hitting the table, and they're like, Tony, Eric, you have to see this. <laughs> and, you know, they just go in, you know, on Anthony Bourdain and Eric for a pair. And I'm just sitting there on the edge of the couch, like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. Like, I have a deck of cards. Like, how can I pass this up? It's Anthony Bourdain. Like, what do I do? And then he, he gets up, and... Um, he puts on his suit jacket, and he, uh, he's like, all right, guys, I got to go. I got to go. Thank you so much. Like, it was so fun. And, you know, what's funny about Anthony is that he saw most of the side of hand, but he allowed us to perform because he understood that magic, kind of like being a chef, is like a practitioner's art form, you know, where the presentation is what matters, you know. It's how you give it to someone is what matters. You know, if you went into a kitchen and saw him, you know, do a dish, you'd be like, 
okay, you're chopping up stuff and put it on the plate, like who cares? But it's what you get at the table that, that really matters, you know? And he understood that. So he, he watched us from that viewpoint. So anyways, he gets up, put his jackets on, he goes to leave. And I go to shake his hand and I'm like, can, can I show you something? And then I'm already in. Like, I'm like, holy shit, what am I gonna do? And I decided to p perform this trick uh, called Angle Zero. Angle Z, we call it. Which is actually a trick invented by Daniel Madison, one of the main characters in the book. And it's a really ingenious contribution to the magic industry. It's actually like, like a very unique effect for the time. He invented it, I think, 12 years ago. And um, actually, I, I, can, I can show you this one, actually. <laughs> Let me see. <laughs> It only requires one playing card. Let me see if I have a card here. I think I got some. I should have a card. Okay. Oh, here we go. Okay, so um, you just take a playing card, right? And you just rip the corner off. Like, really, just like this. Right? So I'm, it's me. I'm with Anthony Bourdain. Or Baker. Oh, you're going to think? Anyways, <laughs> it's me. That was not in this direction. <laughs> well, look, didn't you? <laughs> so I'm here, I have the corner, and I just go to Anthony and like, just watch, right? And, I'm just, and I just open my hand, and the corner's gone. So I'm holding this card, and the corner's gone. Right? But it, it doesn't just disappear, right? All right, Kyle, I'm going to go like this. I'm going to scan the orange. You can just say stop whenever you like. Stop. Right here. Gentleman with the mustache. Yeah. Please stand up. Announce your name to everyone. Uh, my name's Stephen Whitaker. Stephen Whitaker. Hey. Can you please reach into your pocket? I don't know which one, but reach in your pocket. I think you'll find something. Stop. Hold it up. <laughs> That's why I did Anthony Bourdain. But what's really, really kind of amazing about the experience is that he passed away a few months after that. You know, he committed suicide. And I write in the book, I'm like, I, I just wonder how long that moment stayed with him. Because he was flabbergasted. You know what I'm saying? Like, the, the look he gave me, I couldn't help but think that it stayed with him for at least a couple minutes. Maybe he got outside and he got in the cab and he still had the corner, because I can't find the corner. He might just have taken it with him, because I only had the rest of the card in my desk. I still have that piece. So I hope that, you know, the magic stayed with him for a little bit, because he's someone who gave magic to the world, too. So that was one of the most memorable experiences. It's in the book. It's a chapter called Fooling Bourdain, and that's, that's, that, and that's where that chapter is, yeah. I mean, I don't want to keep us all too long, because we have a lot of other stuff to get through. Um, Maybe, what do you think? We've got a couple more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, How many more minutes? <laughs> okay, cool. A couple more, Kyle. Yeah, so, I mean, you talk throughout the book, like Instagram is a running theme, YouTube is a running theme. Right. There's all of these, like magic exists in a whole different form online than right. it used to, like on a stage or right in front of you. Uh, so can you talk a bit about how how technology and how these new platforms are, are changing the whole experience of magic. Yeah, I mean, I kind of touched on a little bit with how magic has changed from a monarchy into a democracy with people having this kind of inherent freedom now with these tools at their fingertips. But it is, I can't even, I can't even state to the fullest degree as to how much the community has changed. The connectivity that, that exists now through platforms like Instagram with the magic community, which is like the beating heart of magicians now, is just astronomical. You know, and the reach that people can have too, with their influence or projecting their own sense of personal brand, and also the business of magic. You know, like Xavier owns his own magic company where you can go online and buy effects or props or gimmicks that can help you do that. You know, and Chris has his his own playing card company. You know, where people buy Chris's decks because they're his. You know, I bet people in this room have a deck on them because you're kind of following this sort of influencer model, which is that people want to follow and, and support and be a part of the world that their idol creates. You know, it's kind of like when people go out and they buy the Michael Jordan Pro model of Nike. It's very, it's very similar in, in that regard. And that's kind of where magic has gone, you know? And technology, too, affects magic tricks. You know, Doug McKenzie, 
he's probably, in my opinion, one of the best close-up performers that I've ever seen. And Doug has amazing tech-based magic, you know, where the, the, the magic he does is exclusive to him. He invented all of it. And it's stuff that it, it, I can't even explain to you how remarkable some of the effects are because it uses your phone, your device. It, it, it's not like he has a phone. He's like, here, watch. You know, the coins are going to come out of the phone. And there's like an app and it just like, you know, goes away. And you're like, oh, you know. Like it, that, like the things that Doug does will twist your understanding of objective reality for real. So it's like technology has, you know, different faces here, you know, where it's like you can use technology to do effects, which is a tool that never existed before, but also technology has allowed magic to disseminate and to find a new audience and to inspire new people. And I think that's been his biggest thing is because magic now is reaching an audience bigger than ever in the past. And that's what I really saw when I was doing this book. I was like, oh my god, like the oldest art form that humans know is changing in a more dramatic way than ever before. You know, this is like a pretty pretty pivotal moment in its history. And that's what like the book too, I hope it acts as like a little bit of a snapshot of this time and what it was like to be here during this moment and to see the most prolific trendsetters and torch carriers do their thing. You know, I, I feel honored to be able to tell that story. What about when like people learning how to do tricks on YouTube and, and other magicians who might give away the, the trick for right. free? Well, that's the thing is that when you're this popular online, especially with like Chris and Xavier, who are very popular on, on YouTube, you carry a, a sense of responsibility into how you project magic, you know? And there are things you can show publicly, secrets, but they're, they're foundational. They're the basics. So if you stumble upon a, a YouTube channel with the most basic moves or effects, you're able really to start learning. And that's the whole point. I mean, you know, any snot-nosed kid can reveal a trick they saw on TV on YouTube because they just want to reveal a trick. But what it really should be and what's going to keep magic going as something that is accessible and people can learn from is when you have great teachers. You know, when you were doing magic in the 80s or 90s, you were supposed to find a mentor. You're supposed to go to the magic shop and find the guy who would teach you the stuff in person. That's being done now in the same way, only through a screen. But the principles of teaching are very much held to the high standards, especially with, with, with these guys, because they're so popular and because people rely on them to uphold those standards. But people still talk shit, obviously, on giving away stuff on the internet. But I mean, <laughs> I, I, I think they're doing a great job. And they've taught me everything I know, so can't complain. Yeah, I feel like one, one thing that I didn't understand as much, and I'm sure lots of people don't, is that magic tricks are a kind of intellectual property. Like, there are, people invent them, people kind of have control over them, and they make money through selling them, not just to a distributor, but to like individual people, young magicians who want to learn how to do those tricks. What, what's your understanding of the economics, basically, of the magic industry? Well, you can sell effects through online retailers. So if a magician invents a trick, you can go to an online retailer, you work a deal out with them where they host your effect, and then people go online, they see a trailer video that doesn't reveal the method, but entices them enough to pay money to know how it's done so they can perform it themselves. And sometimes you need like a gimmick or a prop to go along with that. Um, but you can also start selling tricks individually. You know, Chris and Xavier have both sold effects that are instructional, that people only buy from them and not through an online retail outlet. But, you know, in terms of intellectual property and that kind of thing, you know, of course people get ripped off all the time. I mean, there's no, there's no hard and fast laws that protect magic tricks unless they're patented, which would require it to be a device, but then you have to give away the secret of how it's done, which kind of defeats the whole process, you know, the whole, the whole point of the whole thing. So I think that's kind of like the weird in-between here. You know, and magic has really kind of operated on the honor system. You know, a lot of people break that honor system, but, you know, it's just kind of how it goes. But, you know, a lot of magicians really try to uphold themselves to those standards where they don't blatantly steal work or copy it without credit or anything like that. Uh, so what, now that the book is done, like you've, you've wrapped up this book, you've told this story, what kind of place do you feel like magic has in your life? I mean, I think you're going to be dragged into it quite a bit over the next year or two, <laughs> talking yeah. about the book and thinking about it. Well, I mean, I don't think I'll ever lose the magic bug, you know? I feel like once you catch the bug, it kind of stays in you. You know, the things you learn and the experiences you have are what kind of make, make up who you are, you know? I don't think I'll, I don't think I'll ever start, uh, ever, ever stop. 
uh, performing magic for friends or learning more or trying to invent new stuff, I feel like that's the whole point of what I'm supposed to take away from this journey. You know, and I've obviously made like some very close friends, you know, like I hang out with these guys all the time, you know, I talk to them all the time. And that's kind of like been the whole point is the connections in the community that I'm a part of now, you know. Even if I hadn't learned or performed any magic, but I still made these friends, I would still think it was a success, at least for me personally. So, I mean, I'll still be going to magic conventions, you know, and doing my thing and hanging out. And, uh, you know, that's all I can that's all I can really hope for. You know, and, and with that, I think I would love to bring the guys up, if, you, if you'd like. Chris, Doug, and Xavier. <laughs> What's that? Audience questions. Yeah. So, now that I have them up here, um, you can ask some questions to any of us if you'd like about different parts of the journey. Um, I'd be happy to answer anything, or if you have a question for Chris or Doug or Xavier, um, we can do that. Peter Just here has a microphone. I'll do my best to get to you. So, uh, raise your hands and I'll call on people if you'd like. <laughs> Michael. Nice. Hey. Can I wait for the mic? Yeah, sure. This is uh, looking a lot like a magic convention. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe this is self-evident, but why do we love being tricked? Why is that a joyful experience? I think magic shows you that anything's possible in the world, you know? That deception has a happy ending. That wonder and astonishment still exists. And it's just kind of strange and perhaps fitting that it comes so alive in just a very intimate and simple situation that's just a card trick, you know? The most, the most profound of experience can be found with 52 pieces of paper, you know? And I, and, and I think that's what magic is really about, is being able to translate that sense of hope or wonder to someone else. And I, I'm still trying to wrap my head around how to answer that question, you know? I've been living this for years now, I still, I can't really put it into words, but that's how I would, you know, really talk about it, you know? It, it, it's amazing what, what you can share with someone through something as simple as that. Next question. question. Cole Barish, <laughs> my homie. <laughs> so, uh, how would you describe uh, the subculture of magic compared to the other subcultures that you've spent time in? How is it different? How is it similar? I mean, I think that with magic, you have more so than other subcultures I, I've kind of tapped into. I think magic is something you dedicate your entire life to. You know, I think once you're in it, it never really leaves you. You know, I kind of just kind of touched upon that. That'll never really leave me. But magicians, like, they dedicate their lives to this thing in, 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 in one way or another. You know, maybe you don't perform anymore, but it's still a part of you. You know, I, I've never really seen such passion and dedication, you know, really at all. I mean, it's almost like, you know, other art forms like painters or photographers or, you know, once you become that, and it almost becomes you at the same time, you can't really get away from it. So it's, it's kind of like that. You know, I, I know magicians who really don't perform at all, but there's still people who love the craft and who are still progressing it in their own way and who are still looked up to by other magicians, you know? Yeah. Sure, right here. here you go. I, have a question for, oh. I have a question for Chris. Uh, What's up? <laughs> <laughs> stand up, stand up. Okay, is there any way to still get your cards for V1 and V2? <laughs> Do you not have a deck? Do you? No. Okay, I'll give you one after. Oh, thank you. All right, no uh, and I want to. And I have another thing. I have a comment in Mr. Peace's video yeah. about with the ma the magicians. You should have won. Oh, thanks, man. Appreciate it. Fun fact. Yeah, we. Fun fact. We all split that afterwards. So before going into it, that's what we said. We split it. So it was all good. But thank you. <laughs> Chris, can I have a deck too afterward? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> No. Why do you think magic is overwhelmingly men? Oh, um, I think it's just, well, it's, it's just mainly been that for so long, uh, where the woman has been the assistant, and that's changing now. Uh, so I think that that's great. And I think more and more uh, women are getting into magic and cardistry uh, because they're seeing that, uh, that obviously there's, there's a place for them there too. I just, I just think in the past, because of the way society is, that they've sort of been repressed or like pushed aside or not taken seriously. And I think that's changing, so. There's, there's a few in the audience tonight, actually. Female 
There you go. Give it up for them. Yeah, 100%. Yep, one more over here. Um, how, can you talk about a little bit how you came up with the, with the title, with the name for the book? Sure. So um, the mantra of the 52 is magic is dead. And, you know, the 52 is the secret society that I became a member of, you know, which was founded by Daniel Madison and Laura London, a female magician who is also one of the main characters in the book. You know, and the mantra is kind of tongue in cheek because ma you know magic is obviously not dead, right? But it's kind of up to magicians now to convince the audience that it's still alive in a way, and that's always what Daniel's kind of said about it. But I think it also has a connotation towards you know maybe the magic you thought existed is is dead, but it's being replaced with something new and maybe more innovative or more profound, you know. And it's just really catchy. I mean, you look at this cover. I mean, <laughs> it's pretty good. And I'll talk about the cover too because we'll get back to Carrie Thornton. So Carrie and I were talking about the cover, and we wanted to do something that was really kind of out there and loud, you know? And Carrie hired this really great design firm from Brooklyn called Morning Breath, Inc. They used to do a lot of, like, skateboard graphics back in the day and music stuff. And they dropped this on us, and we were like, that's it. Like, that's what we want, you know? And it's really out there. Like, in the book world, this is risky. Like, this cover is risky, you know? Usually there's formulas to, like, you have a subhead, and it's, you know, it's, it's like this, and, you know, but I think when you walk into a... Um, a bookstore, this is the first thing you'll see and probably the last thing you'll look at when you leave. Hopefully it's in your bag when you leave too, but nonetheless. There's one over here. In the back. Oh, Peter. I don't <laughs> yeah, you, right? you got a loud voice. He's good. Oh, he's so you talked a bit about uh, how technology has changed the, I guess, the training of magicians. But I'm curious, how has technology changed, or will it change, uh, the actual tricks? Like, do you think that magic requires a, a sort of in-person presence to actually do the tricks, to have that sort of, you know, joy of being tricked? Or do you think that people will get that same sense of wonder just from watching YouTube videos? You want to answer that? Chris is better at... I think that you can still enjoy magic and be fooled through videos, but I think that that true sense, you know, exists more so in person. But Chris can go into deeper detail because he does this for a living. Yeah, great question. Um, noth nothing is better than seeing magic in, in close-up. Nothing, period. Not TV, not YouTube, not stage magic. Um, just close-up magic is the way magic is supposed to be. Uh, digested is the way you're supposed to like take it in. Uh, that's that's what makes it so impossible. Obviously, if it's done through the filter of a screen, um, somebody who's wanting to uh, question how things were done have an easy answer. Uh, so I think that's just normal. But I also think there's an audience for people who appreciate magic in a different way than, uh, let's say, somebody who. Who, d who does magic or somebody who's interested in magic and has seen close-up magic before, I think they can come to appreciate uh, whether that's a performance or a tutorial or something like that. They can appreciate it differently. Um, but yeah, I, d I don't think it's as powerful. For sure, no. Like, I'm, But w videographers um, use different techniques to replace that sense. So whether that's through the music you add or or the actual imagery that you add or the you know, the quality of the image or the storytelling or the narr maybe there's a narrator. And these are things you can't do in real life. So we kind of have to compensate to give you an extra experience that you, you know, that you would otherwise not have. And I think, uh, but, you know, when it comes down to, I think, seeing magic in real life, if done well, is, you know, better than anything else. Yeah. Just yeah, to add to that, is, look at that. Bam. <laughs> you steal the mic. Um, there's an inherent distrust when you see something on screen. You don't know if the person that's watching is in on it or if um, you know, the, the camera is working to the magician's advantage that you're not wanting to, you can't see where you want to see whenever you want to versus where the camera's showing you, if that Robert makes sense. Doug has uh, consulted on, on a bunch of David Blaine's television shows, so he knows about this sort of thing. I know, I know a little bit about it. Um, <laughs> so yeah, it, there's, there's a, it's a, a lot more difficult actually. You have a lot more hurdles to pass when you're trying to show something on TV. You have to try and build the audience's trust that what you're doing uh, would be the same in real life. So 
you know, it's more difficult, but I think the impact is also lower. I mean, the real, the real way to experience magic is in person. Um, it, you know, it, it's, it's an emotion. I think it's uh, a lot harder to convey those emotions um, through a screen. You're, you're disconnected through a screen. The, there's one thing, though, that I, I fight these guys a lot on this. <laughs> I would just like to fight. But one thing is, I, you know, there's people from other countries. There's people in other situations that may not ever get to experience anything close up or in person. And this is the only way that they can experience it. And I think a lot of times we forget, you know, like especially magicians, we get the ego of us, what I want, what I want to do, and we forget that there's a whole other part out there of people who will never see a magician, never meet a magician, never see a trick. And if a YouTube video can do that for them and give them that little thing, I think that's fair. You know, it's, it's good, but it's just, it's just not the best medium, I don't think. Yeah, well, McDonald's isn't the best food, but it's still the best selling. <laughs> Right here, the glasses, yeah. So we got time for maybe one or two more after this one. Uh, what made you realize that magic is an art form and not just like any other hobby? It's a really good question. Because I think a lot of people perhaps view it as just this thing that you do in your spare time, right? Well, well what is art, right? Yeah. So, so uh, are, you, are you a magician or not? <laughs> You are? So there's a really amazing book that just came out by a magician named Juan Tamari, a Spanish magician who's incredible. And the whole first chapter is about what is art and how is magic an art form. And I would highly recommend that you read it, but it basically boils down to the idea that to make something an art form, it has to come from within. It's the expression of yourself through your medium, right? So, you know, he, he, he asked some pretty interesting questions. For example, if you took a photograph, you just took a photograph and put it in, in a um, photo exhibit, does that make it art? Maybe, maybe not, right? If you took a photograph of your friend that you intentionally made a blur to the photograph, does that make it art? Well, potentially. So this, I mean, again, what is art and, and how, do you, how do you make your magic art? This, I think, is a better question. And I would recommend that book, too. <clears throat> and, I'll, and I'll build off that, too, because I kind of, I didn't really see it as that at first, you know? I was just like, magic tricks are cool, right? But when you get to understand where these people come from, magicians, whether you're young or old or in the middle or good or bad or whatever, you know, the amount of passion they bring into it and how much they care about how it's translated to others is what makes it art to me. Like Doug said, it comes from within, you know? I think it's the intent is what makes it art. Intent is what you're looking at here, you know? If you subvert intent, you're losing out on the impact that it can have because you know yourself, the creator of it, that it's not there. And that's the worst part, even if you don't say it. But I think all the magicians I've met who are dedicated to this craft see it as an art form and they project it as such. And that's why it is an art form rather than a hobby to me. If you, if you put something of yourself into it, mean, there's, there's so many pieces of magic, you can read the book and you can perform it verbatim, right? You can say the exact same things and use the same techniques. But the more you perform a piece of magic, the more you start to understand it and the more you start to put more of yourself into it, right? So there's plenty of classic piece of magic that all of us perform. But because you perform it so much, you start to change things about it and make it yours, right? Now, you can find another magician that does the exact same effect, but it's, they do it differently, a little bit differently than you. You might have little details and touches on it. And as soon as you start to put yourself into the magic, I think that's when it becomes art. <laughs>